fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the house of mystery. I'm Al Warren and we've got the biggest mystery of all. <laughs> <laughs> David North Martino in the house. That's right. A conundrum wrapped in a mystery, wrapped in an enigma. Yeah, or something yeah. like that. You got I told you, you can't <laughs> swear on the air. What are you no. doing? Conundrum. You don't have to say that word. No. Filthy boy. Terrible. Yeah. I'm telling you. Your mother. <laughs> I'm going to have to talk to your mother. She's oh, gonna, no. Yeah. She's got to be better manners than this. So. She'll wash but, my mouth up with soap. Did she ever really do that? No, no, no. That was that a never happened. Yeah, was it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Was that was that a normal thing? It was normal like in your household. But I don't. I don't know anybody that ever really had it done. Yeah, but it probably no. is. But just <laughs> just saying, it never happened to me either. But it was threatened. But we did get the belt back. Yes. In the old oh yeah. Years, you know. Mm hmm. Warms my heart. Yes. Um. Now today the other we're parts. Well, yeah, well, <laughs> I told you, don't talk that way, right? We're an important show here. That's right. Um, okay, so now we have uh, an author joining us, and he's got quite a history. He's been, you know, more than just an author, and it's very interesting. And now the book is called Zenith Man, Death, Love, and Redemption in a Georgia Courtroom. So this, uh, welcome McCracken Poston Jr. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. This is the uh, perfectly named podcast for this story. Yeah, sounds like it. Quite a story. Now, before we get into it, let's talk about you. Um, um, and before you got into writing this book, it looks like you've been uh, you're part of the Georgia House of Reps. Um, you've had quite a quite a little history of here. So, um, d did you know you were going to be getting into writing anywhere in your life? Is this something that kind of just came up late? You know, I had an elementary school principal that made us all learn uh, and recite Robert Frost poetry. So for a little Southern Appalachian elementary school, uh, we were probably uh, getting ahead of the game, but I had no plans. Um, this story, though, uh, like Maya Angelou said, uh, bearing an untold story inside of you, there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside of you. And I, I felt that when I read that quote, I, I said, I know how that feels because this case just weighed heavily on me for many, many years. And it was quite a, uh, a ride, a, uh, a wild ride as the Atlanta journal constitution, uh, said, but it's a true story. Uh, it's the classic, uh, rush to judgment case. Um, my client uh, was unusual. He uh, probably caused a lot of the suspicion uh, that surrounded him. Well, he definitely caused it. But we finally got a reason just a couple of years ago as to what was motivating him and why why he uh, appeared to be so suspicious. Yes, yeah, it's, it's always interesting because you never know until you meet them, kind of. There's always something about being involved in the case rather than just seeing it on TV or hearing about it in a newspaper. What what actually drew you into this case where you wanted to write about it? Well, I grew up in uh, around Ringgold, Georgia. I grew up in a little smaller town, actually, in Catoosa County, Georgia. That's northwest Georgia, just south of Chattanooga, Tennessee. And this guy was our TV repairman. Uh, he was a classic picture tube television sales and repairman under the Zenith brand, hence the name of the book. He uh, went to high school with one of my sisters. And yet the first time I ever really saw him, uh, he was waved into the house by my mother 
who didn't tell me, and I was trying to watch uh, live wrestling on television. I was about 13, and suddenly there's a strange man in the house uh, to bring a new knob for our television. I had worn off the channel changer knob, and uh, my father ordered a replacement. The only reason I remembered that years later was the uh, my client, who was very unusual acting, he told me that he had met Andre the Giant, and he told me that Andre the Giant ate a dozen eggs for breakfast and a loaf of bread. And, of course, I went to school telling everybody that I knew somebody who knew Andre the Giant. So I remembered that suddenly when I'm representing this guy for murder, and he tells me the same story. And I thought, you've told me this before. <laughs> you told me this, you know, decades ago because I went to school bragging about it. And and he's uh, he was a guy who was extremely difficult, yet he stalked me on the street three days after his wife of 32 years was found dead in his house. The problem is nobody knew he had a wife because he had been denying her existence for almost 30 years. Uh, anybody who asked, hey, weren't you married once? He would come up with a different story to tell them every time. And so he seemed very suspicious. Her uh, siblings uh, kind of revived a lot of old stories about uh, captivity and and uh, keeping her family away, and that just fueled everything. The National Examiner tabloid uh, comes out with a headline, Sicko Holes Wife Captive 30 Years, Then Kills Her. And that was, of course, uh, just making it a, a complete circus. I had just lost a congressional race. And I mean, when I say lost, I got the hell beat out of it. I was uh, pretty down myself. I uh, tried for a presidential appointment. Uh, that kind of blew up on my face, even though I wasn't even asking for it. It got suggested that I that I could be appointed to something, and then it blew up. Uh, so I was pretty down, and here's this guy uh, kind of meeting me on the same corner of street for three days in a row, and he's a hermit. You, people hardly ever saw him, and here I'm seeing him three days in a row. So when I finally just, you know, looked at him and spoke to him, it just opened up a whole box of ills that he just poured out uh, right there on the street about all the... Uh, woes that uh, he and his family had had endured over the years. And a lot of it was, was nonsense. Uh, there was a lot of uh, civil litigation that he did, and it was the classic definition of frivolous. But he was very sincere about it. He had a kind of a Rube Goldberg uh, causal connection diagram in his head of what made a minor car accident that his father drove away from, uh, how that turned into his father's death two years later from pancreatic cancer. So that's that started all the litigation. He and his wife had been evicted from public housing in uh, on September 15, 1970, one of those dates that lived in infamy in his head. And uh, that was the last place and time and date that Virginia Ridley was ever seen. September 15, 1970, in the large courtroom of the Catoosa County Courthouse. So it wasn't an immediate arrest. Uh, they continued to talk with him, going against my street advice for him to shut up. Uh, he would speak to anybody who would talk to him. He would let them all into his house, into his business, which had been shuttered for 15 years. And yet, when I started to represent him, he would turn me away. He would not let me see his house. And that went on for over a year. So he was an extremely difficult client. Right. Well, so what did you put together with the about the relationship between him and his wife? Uh, was she really captive? Was she secret? Or was it just, like, that seems to be unusual how nobody really knew she existed. Or was that not real? No, no, nobody really knew. Uh, I, he wanted me to study all of this old litigation. And to get him to help me with the murder case, I would almost have to strike these bargains. I realized he was very transactional. 
So I would strike these bargains that I would go look at this old civil litigation, including the eviction, and I would advise him on that, even though it was all dead and done and, you know, raised judicata. We were, you know, we were not going to be able to relitigate any of that. But he, um, but he had me look at it, and I'm really glad he did because in the eviction file I found a jury list. It was a jury trial over an eviction, and there were a lot of names that uh, I knew, remembered from childhood. Most of them dead, but uh, because this had been 27 years later, but I saw a name of a woman that I still knew. So I reached out to the woman. I said, "Can you tell me about this eviction trial you may or may not remember from 27 years before?" And she said. I remember it just like it was yesterday. It was the strangest thing. And she said that my client Alvin had made such a circus out of this trial that the judge just stopped him and said, Mr. Ridley, just get your wife. So his father went and fetched Virginia. She came into the courtroom, and lo and behold, her parents were there, her parents who had been trying to flush her out for two or three years. They had posted... Uh, articles in the newspaper that their daughter was missing. They all went back into the judge's chamber, except for Alvin. He was not allowed to go. Uh, They all came out, and according to what Alvin reports his wife and father told him, Virginia cited some scripture and said, I'm with my husband now. I am one with my husband now. That's where I need to be. That's where I want to be. And so her parents pretty much gave up all of the efforts to flush her out. But 27 years later, when she's dead, her sisters and uh, picked up the mantle of the uh, wildest allegations of human captivity, and they ran with it. And, of course, the tabloids and the media ran with it. So it was a, a, it was a very awkward situation. Alvin said from day one that his wife had epilepsy, and that was well known. She had it since childhood, so her family even knew that. She occasionally had reactions to the medicine, so she was really um, not that compliant with medication. And so um, what I needed, uh, because the state was saying these little petechial hemorrhages around her eyes and mouth, that that was indicative of an asphyxiation death of uh, and and they charged Alvin with that murder, I knew that I needed to see another epilepsy death. And fortunately, they're rare. Uh, fortunately, you know, there's good medication available. And so uh, people who have epilepsy are very often, uh, you know, well in control. But uh, out of the blue, uh, just a few months before trial, and I had nothing because Alvin still wouldn't let me in his house. The Olympic track star Florence Griffith Joyner passed away. About a month later, they, they announced that she died of a seizure disorder. The following Monday, I was on the phone with the doctor in Orange County, California, who autopsied uh, Flojo, as she was popularly called. Her autopsy looked remarkably like that of Virginia Ridley. And this was possibly the most famous athlete in the world at that time. Definitely the most famous one to pass away that year. And because of unfounded allegations of performance-enhancing drugs, she was given an extremely uh, extensive and uh, thorough autopsy. Uh, By the way, the only thing in her system was Benadryl and a therapeutic amount. So um, her her greatness uh, really uh, was was uh, not tarnished by her death, and so um, as it turned out, uh, their their autopsy the sh- the condition of their bodies were very similar, and so I had that even though it was going to be very difficult to get in, but I shared it with the DA so he could show it to his state state doctor. And then I had an epilepsy expert named Braxton Bryant Wanamaker out of Orangeburg, South Carolina. And this is the guy that in 1998 internet, I was able to find on in all the medical abstracts that he seemed to be the expert. And this is 1998. I couldn't cut and paste a URL. So I was handwriting URLs down and, and very, uh, 
intensely hoping that 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 I put a forward slash and not a backward slash. Uh, it was it was it was so uh, uh, tedious. So that's all we had. Uh, Thanksgiving of 1998, my new wife. I had gone through a divorce right after the the congressional defeat, and I had remarried the next year. We went to Thanksgiving at our uh, families, our different families, and my family. My parents uh, packaged up a sack, and they said, uh, we want you to take this Thanksgiving meal to Mr. Ridley. That was the last place I wanted to go on Thanksgiving because he and I would fight. He and I, he and I would fight. We would yell at each other at one point because he wanted to talk about his van being seized by the county, and he wanted to talk about the eviction in 1970. And this was 1998, and we were screaming toward a January 1999 trial date. And here we are Thanksgiving, five weeks out. But I did dutifully uh, take, deliver this Thanksgiving meal to him. Now, again, I should have realized how transactional he was. When I show up with this delicious meal, he feels like he needs to give me something. So he invited me into his home. And it was the most strange uh, uncomfortable place because it was just uh, uh, a poor home uh, with not good ventilation, not a real good uh, smell, and apparently a good a lot of vermin. And uh, but I went in, and when my eyes adjusted to the single light bulb light, I could see one whole wall was covered with writing, and not not on the wall, but on pieces of paper that were attached to the wall various ways. Nailed, taped, tacked, just a wall covered in writings, and apparently by the same hand. And so immediately, you know, I started reading it, and there's a recipe. Here's a, a, a list of the cast of the CBS series The Waltons with all the actors' names. Here, here, here's uh, correspondence with uh, television evangelical ministers and... Uh, and here's something from the, the HUD secretary from the 1970s referencing a letter that she wrote to President Richard M. Nixon about their eviction. And so I said, Alvin, who wrote this? And I was, my heart was beating because I wanted it to be her so badly. And he said, well, Virginia did. And I said, what do you think? Why do you think she wrote so much? And he said, well, it, because I guess the Lord told her to. Well, it was not just writing a few things down. This woman documented almost every moment of her life. There were boxes and boxes and boxes of notebooks and loose leaf paper. There was the inside of cereal boxes that suddenly had ink uh, written on, turned around, turned into a nice piece of cardboard and, and filled with various observations that she had. They weren't ramblings. They, they all had intent. There would be a, a, a Bible lesson. There would be a glossary of legal terms, which I started realizing she may have been the mastermind behind some of that litigation that Alvin was doing, and because she seemed to understand it better than, than he could articulate it. And so uh, I said, you know, Alvin, I've got to have this. And he said, uh, no, no. Uh, that's all I got left over. You can't have any of it. So I had to start trying to, Alvin and I had this process of communication that happened very early in the, in the case when he would start yelling at me about his van being taken in 1984. And at one point I was exasperated and I just said, Oh Lord, he stopped. He thought I was praying. And I thought I can, I can, I can run with this. And so I began to pray my legal advice to him, but he wasn't that naive. I'd get through with this long, you know, uh, fire and brimstone prayer about how he needed to let me in his house or how he uh, needed to cooperate in the murder case. And he uh, he would say, I'll think about it. But the bottom line is he, he got quiet and, 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 and I was able to get out what needed to be done. Interestingly enough, at probably the lowest point of um, the representation when I just thought, have I, have I taken on something that I just don't need to be a part of, um, the, our congressman called 
Now, this was the guy that whipped my butt less than two years before. And Alvin got kind of interested that I had the congressman calling me. He seemed to sit up a little straighter, and and he he chided me for not immediately calling him back. So I called the congressman back, and I said, uh, hello, congressman, how are you doing? He said, keep Alvin Ridley away from my congressional offices. He's scaring the ladies there. Well, in a way, that motivated me. In a way, it was like the election again, only this time I had one constituent, one issue, and that was vindicating Alvin Ridley. And so the congressman really did motivate me and and probably kept me in the case. But um, when I found our epilepsy expert, uh, before I put him on the stand, he just asked this one last question that was absolutely stunning uh, in its impact. He said, was there anything else unusual about this woman? And I laughed and I said, yeah, she could not have a thought without writing it down. And he said, oh, that's hypergraphia. That's often associated with temporal lobe epilepsy. And it's quite common. A lot of my patients have it. That was huge to me because it was not the ramblings of a crazy woman who just, you know, felt the need to write down uh, the cast of the Waltons or or send a proposed script, a pitch to the TV show Unsolved Mysteries. And guess what she was pitching to Unsolved Mysteries? The mystery of Alvin's van being taken by Catoosa County authorities. Oh yeah, that's what's important here. <laughs> and yeah. so she was. She shared these paranoid views with him and conspiracy theories with him. They were the perfect couple. It, it explained to me the last component. And so we had quite a trial uh, over several court appearances. Alvin proved to be unreliable to come to court or stay in court. That created quite a problem for me. And uh, at some one point, he fled, and I found him at the VA uh, clinic. He he had been a, a U.S. Army veteran for two years. And, uh, you know, I went, the judge said, if you head him back by 1.30, I'll still let you have your motions hearing. And so I just went to Chattanooga and got him because I called up, up there thinking that was the only place he would go because he was very often complaining about how he felt. He used to cite a non-existing clause of the Constitution saying, the Constitution says you don't have to go to court if you don't feel well. <laughs> well, I had to start carrying around paperback copy of the U.S. Constitution to challenge him on it every time he tried to raise it. And uh, But I you know, told him he had to get in the car. We had to get back to Ringgold, Georgia. And uh, you know, I just told him off the whole way down there. I feel quite guilty some, uh, how... Sometimes I spoke to him because I was so frustrated. And uh, so, you know, we get to court and I decide to tell the court this lame sounding excuse that he had for being at the doctor and not be in court. And I said, Your Honor, he, he says he got bit by a giant spider. And I was kind of like trying to wink at the judge, like, you know, give us a break, judge. Look what I'm working with here. Suddenly the judge just, his face went ashen and I turned around and Alvin had raised his shirt revealing the most grotesque big spider bite I've ever seen. So he was actually legit about that. And the judge said, oh, we'll, we'll do this another day. You know, you go home and rest. So, uh, so it was just constantly that. And I had to try two murder cases back to back. And, but we're, drawing out of the same jury pool. So I insisted that Alvin come and answer up the calendar and then sit and help me take notes of, of potential jurors because we're going to be drawing his jury just in a few days out of the same group of people. Well, I didn't see, but Alvin escaped and was detained in Rome, Georgia, an hour away for giving the U.S. Marshals the bums rush and running into a federal judge's office reeking of gasoline they thought he had doused himself with, screaming about his lawyer not having 
knocked his case out yet, according to what they said. So Alvin explained to them that his car had broken down, that he had gotten up into the carburetor and, and got what he calls the perfumes of gas on him. And so uh, I was waiting on him when he got home. I was so mad. I, you know, it was after that day of the first trial I had to try. And uh, I was telling him off, and I said, what in the hell were you thinking? And he said, well, my legal advisor suggested I try that. Well, I was the only guy I thought that talked to him. And so I said, who is your legal advisor? He said, salesman Sam. Well, Salesman Sam was a guy who rode on a bicycle selling things out of catalogs in the basket of the bicycle. And when I confronted this guy for practicing law without a license, he suggested that he had been given Alvin Ridley legal advice since before my I could walk. So I had to deal with that as well. And it was just an ordeal. And there at the uh, at the trial... Uh, we did bring uh, Dr. Wanamaker in, who testified beautifully. It set up the notion that the petechial hemorrhages that the state was uh, depending on to show uh, asphyxiation, uh, a soft strangulation, or suffocation with a pillow. Um, our theory was that Virginia had a seizure sleeping on her front and positioned herself to where either she could not breathe, uh, or it, uh, the saliva formed a, a, a seal around her mouth and she was seizing in, in a position not to even turn her head to get a breath. Uh, or as Dr. Wanamaker said, sometimes they just die uh, during seizure activity. And so uh, what, what was so uh, interesting was I had planned all along, no way is Alvin going to testify because I knew if I was trying to make him a sympathetic character and he wanted to talk about the county taking his van, that was going to be a problem. And uh, lo and behold, uh, Jesus during lunch showed up and directed Alvin that he had to testify. And uh, so uh, I was very skeptical, but that is the one thing that is the defendant's call. Uh, the lawyer can make all kinds of strategy decisions, what witness to call, uh, what what uh, defenses to use. But as to whether or not you testify, that is the sole province of the defendant. And so I knew he was going to testify. I just tried to prepare him for it. As it turned out, he testified beautifully because I let Alvin be Alvin. We just decided to let all the conspiracies unspool and including the eviction and including the the uh the various uh seizures and there was just enough small town uh vindictiveness in some of these old stories that you know it's that old saying just because you're paranoid don't mean they're not after you <laughs> and and so there was just enough of that to make Alvin somewhat of a sympathetic figure but i would forget how literal and I would get ahead of myself and I would say Alvin tell the jury what you lost and I was wanting him to say the love of my life or my best friend and he looked and he says oh I guess the funeral bill well you can imagine what the DA did with that uh, of course the DA had his own problems because I figured if I couldn't get anything out of Alvin in 15 months I wasn't worried about the DA getting anything out of him and sure enough the DA was struggling with him over the notion of where he got the quarter to make his phone calls that morning. He didn't realize that Alvin slept in his clothes, and he didn't realize that Alvin also slept with what sounded like $23 in coin in his pocket. So because he was rattling it throughout the whole trial, I was constantly grabbing his arm. Well, uh, gentlemen, we won the case, but only three years ago, and by the way, this case has been featured on Forensic Files, American Justice, People Magazine, NPR's Snap Judgment, the Washington Post front page, but none of them could explain Alvin. He just was a Southern eccentric. And about three years ago, we were participating in another podcast, and um, 
I just gave the story away to anybody who wanted to listen. It was that uh, Maya Angelou agony that I was, I just wanted the story to get out. But one of the jurors in the case, Kimberly Clark Barnes, she's now a nurse in Alaska. And she told the podcast uh, maker, she asked him to ask me, did I ever consider the fact that Alvin may be autistic? She had worked with people on the spectrum. And she recognized some of the things. Well, it suddenly made me realize, made me feel very guilty for the conflicts that I would have with Alvin. But it also made me realize that his autistic mannerisms, and and he he is on the spectrum. Uh, An evaluation in Atlanta revealed that. But it also made me realize that his very, the very autistic mannerisms that, that, uh, helped the doctor uh, come to the conclusion that he is on the spectrum. They were being used against him at trial. His flat vocal effect when he called 911 about his dead wife, The what the officers thought was a mismatch in the moment and Alvin's emotional response to the moment. And the grudges, good Lord, Grudges from childhood uh, we had to deal with. Uh, When picking a jury, uh, Alvin's only standard was, if they like him, he likes them. That's all he said. Uh, You know, I I would try to be a little more strategic about that. But, uh, you know, we got a a couple of people that knew him that he had worked on their television, like mine when I was a child. So... The revelation of Alvin's autism finally formed the book in my head. I did some research, and I learned that there are five and a half million undiagnosed adults with autism that are walking around today. Now, I guarantee if they're having interaction with an inquisitor like a a police officer and a detective or a judge, they may very well rub them the wrong way. They may very well be so seemingly evasive with the answer of their questions. Really, it's a processing issue. Uh, just as Alvin could not process the, you know, the language that I used to ask him questions, we all speak in, in reference and metaphor and, and things that are shorthand for us. And, but a person on the spectrum very often doesn't can't process those that language. And at the same time, I was having a process issue with Alvin and, and how he was reacting and how he was answering questions. That was that was making me have a processing issue for him. So, you know, we've we've had uh, autistic people in our since time began and and some of them uh or on the part of the spectrum that they can be so laser focused on, on things and be brilliant and be the, the, the greatest contributors to science and arts. And Alvin was a hell of a TV repairman. That's, that was his proudest time because he did everybody right. He was kind of cheaper than most, which is why my dad used him. He was uh, very proud of what he did. Um, he was an odd man. He didn't like to bathe another uh, autistic trait. He didn't like the feel of water on his skin. And that made me feel really bad because I kind of got on him about not going to the truck stop and getting a shower before trial. I, I felt bad the minute I said something to him about it. So something in me knew this man can't really help his condition. Interestingly, within... 48 hours of me commenting on his smell, a skunk got in the register under my office and sprayed me and the files of the case, causing Alvin to to complain how I smelled uh, the next time (laughs) we got together. He said, did you have a falling out with a skunk? It, It made me realize I deserved that. You know, we can't always help our circumstances, you know. How do you think this whole case... This whole process of going through this and putting and writing it out in the book, all the details and getting it out there. How do you think that's changed you? It, uh, immensely. First, my first 
fits and starts were just anecdotes. Uh, the, the, the story about the skunk, for example, the, the story about, uh, the finding Virginia's writings. Uh, there's a hilarious story about his two cats that I won't go into now. I got to save something for the readers. Uh, but, um, it, you know, so it was just this disconnected recording of things while it was fresh on my mind. But I met a, uh, I, I tried with four co-writers over the years. And, you know, they would fiddle around with it. And then they would say, you know, not not really, not really get, getting anywhere with this. And so the autism diagnosis made me, it formed it finally in my head that this is a cause that we, I am concerned about other people. But it was not until I really kind of, dug under some scar tissue and hit some raw nerves going on in my own life and to be able to share what representing the Zenith man, Alvin Ridley, uh, what it did for me that I think finally made it sing, as my publisher said, as a book. The changes that I was going through, the uh, I, my father, who I loved dearly, suffered with alcoholism uh, all of my life. And I realized, looking back on notes, that we were hospitalizing my father about the time I was first starting to to counsel Alvin. And once my father sobered up, I had a, a, a good talk with him, one of the first good talks I'd had with him in years. And he said he encouraged me to help Alvin. And he said he's a good man. He just is, is he, he thinks differently than, than others. And that's all, all I had to go on. So I kind of, you know, wanting to please my dad, wanting to get revenge on the congressman. I had a lot of motivations for sticking with Alvin. And I learned slowly that Alvin was a good person. He, he, he had a, a, a bit of a charm about him, especially when there were any ladies around. He was raised right. So I made sure I had a secretary or a, my high school intern around and Alvin was the absolute quietest most polite person in the world when they were around so we figured out how to keep from yelling at each other between the fake prayers and having one of the secretaries around but I had to literally because of his issues about Virginia's writings I had to basically pay him to rent the writings to make copies and while he's hovering over me, making sure that I put every one of them back, I would find one that I thought, if he doesn't bring this, we're going to lose. So I would say, Alvin, do you want a Coke? Go to the fridge in there in the office and grab one for you. And I would drop that one behind the copier because I wanted to be sure I had something because he wouldn't let me keep it. So he brings these suitcases to court with all her writings that I had picked out and then he would shuffle them around where I could not even find what I had picked out. But with the suitcases, he brought in scores of cockroaches into the courtroom. So badly that on Forensic Files, Season 5, Episode 9, juror Kimberly Clark Barnes comments on it on, on the air. And uh, we released so many roaches into the courtroom that the judge, knowing that his office was right next to that one, ordered us to finish the trial in the old courthouse, in the old 1939 large grand courtroom, the last place Virginia Ridley had ever been seen in public, September 15, 1970. So it was eerie. I'm not a real ghost chaser or anything like that, but there, it, there was an eeriness to reuniting Virginia's writings with the last place she had ever been seen. And so uh, it, it, between that and Alvin defying my advice and taking the stand, he was acquitted. And um, I feel very fortunate to have been a part of his case. For the last 25 years, for the most part of 25 years, Alvin and I have had lunch every week. And he turns 82 in a few days. He's still uh, the same as he always was. But he's a lot calmer now, and I attribute that to the community warming up to him. Uh, he allowed me to be very public with his autism diagnosis. I think we know so much more about autism now 
and a lot of people have someone with autism in their family. And so we've had some quite poignant uh, meetings uh, between Alvin and the people who were trying to put him in prison the rest of his life, who now are very kind to him. Uh, one of the main witnesses against him had him over for Thanksgiving for Thanksgiving dinner. And, and I mean Christmas. Had him over to their house on Christmas because he got lost and I had to leave my family to go make sure he got there. So uh, so it's just kind of a small town tale. By the way, uh, Virginia was obsessed with the actor, director, producer, Ron Howard. And if you think about it, Ron Howard always played these very wholesome roles in either the Andy Griffith Show or Happy Days. She was obsessed with him. And I introduced uh, a, a photo of Ron Howard and his new wife, Cheryl, that she wrote all over. And uh, so I just wanted the jurors to see, look, this, this lady was into popular culture. It may have been kind of wholesome popular culture between the Waltons and Ron Howard, but she she was living a, a happy life. She wrote uh, that God told her to quit taking her medicine in September of 1977. Well, that meant she lived 20 years without medicating. And dutifully, because Alvin threw nothing away, we had the empty medicine bottles up until September of 1977, and we had several months of filled medicine bottles from that date and beyond. So Alvin was trying to take care of her. Now, do you think that this case changed or might change in retrospect how the court system or lawyer, lawyers work with uh, people like Alvin? Well, it's going to take the book to get the word out because the book is the first telling of the story that includes his autism. And, and so hopefully there will be a rethinking. Uh, I've reached out to a lot of, uh, there's a lot of groups that concentrate on uh, autism and the criminal justice system. And I'm hoping that it does something to help. I know years ago that uh, there was a general uh, police training component about dealing with someone with a mental illness, like if it's obvious or had, if you're told that that person, for, for example, is schizophrenic. And it's, it's a more measured, slow approach. Get, get, a, get as many other officers with you as possible and just slowly close in while you're talking the whole time to, to try to, to secure them. Well, with Alvin, it's not that detectable at first. And, uh, and autism, again, has nothing to do with the intellect. Some of the smartest people in the world are on the spectrum. But it does have to do with the processing of orders and slang that's often used by, you know, all of us. And, you know, you throw slang language at somebody like Alvin and he's not he's he's going to wonder what in the hell are you saying? You're, you're making no sense. You know, it's, it's just one of those things that I hope does get people thinking uh, both law enforcement evaluators when when a, a person has a psychological evaluation for forensic purposes and judges uh, we all know judges who can uh, who can have their day uh, ruined by a client that they think uh, not a client a, a person standing before them that they think is just dis being disrespectful to the court and that can ruin somebody's day well it could be that they're just having problems processing the court or they're not sh showing the right emotion that the court thinks that they should be showing. So um, I've been very pleased uh, that a lot of people who have an autistic person in their family, they've read my book and they said, yes, I, I could have told you that, that he was on the spectrum by, by the way you're describing him. I'm just glad that Alvin has his best life right now. He has respect in the community. He has uh, uh, people kind of understand now why he doesn't like to bathe. I bought him a new suit. He's he's he, The guy's always had an air of dignity about him. His hair is always uh, nicely done. Now he gets it mostly buzzed off. But he used to have hair that was always combed. He, he was always clean-shaven. And so he had a, a, a dignity about him, and hopefully he gets to 
retain that now for the rest of his years. Yeah, it's quite it's quite a world. Well, at least nowadays people are aware of autism and they're a little bit more uh, on it. I know when I was young, nobody really considered it. Right? It wasn't something that people talked about. So it's a, it's changed a lot. So I think it's going in the right direction. Just take. I, I do too. The Atlanta Journal Constitution opined about my book that. Uh, we used to just be dismissive of people like Alvin, and we just called them the town eccentrics. And every small town had them. The only difference between small towns and big towns is that we all know ours by name, and we know some. some we knew, we know their mama and daddy maybe, and we know some of their backstory. That's the only difference in a small town, but it doesn't make it any easier uh, when Alvin would be carrying on like he was uh, with his litigiousness and with his kind of a odd causal relationships that he would apply to that litigiousness. So so it was very, uh, now hopefully we can see these individuals as people and as people who perhaps see things differently and hear things differently than the rest of us. Well, Okay, so let's see. Uh, book is available. Do you have a website? Do you do social media for readers to find? How do it all. I'm, I'm easy to find. There's not many McCracken postings. And uh, <laughs> my son and I are the only living ones. I was uh, the son of McCracken Poston Sr. And my my son, uh, one of my sons is at the University of Georgia. But he he has a different middle name, so he's, he's not a junior or a third. Uh, on Twitter, it's... At Real Zenith Man. I say it at Real Zenith Man because there's another book out there called Zenith Man, and it's our story, fictionalized. Uh, kind of made me mad at first, but it was also a great motivator to get sit down and start writing. And uh, so um, there's no copyright in titles. So, um, you know, New Line Cinema almost did a movie about this case uh, 20 years ago. And it wouldn't have been that good because we didn't know the autism uh, angle then. So uh, that may may have been why it never got made. But um, McCracken Poston Jr. for Junior ought to be, you ought to be able to find me on Facebook, Instagram, uh, even TikTok, which is oh, you go. totally <laughs> baffling to me. But uh, I've had a lot of children and teenagers explain to me what it is and what it does so you'll have a good time it's all good <laughs> okay now we're going to have your book up we'll have uh everything for people uh to find you and appreciate you being here uh, great book it's called the zenith man and it's death love and redemption in a georgia courtroom and the author is mccracken poston jr thank you again for being here it's the kissing couple on the cover, and that's Alvin and Virginia, a rare photo of Virginia. Oh, that is her, eh? Oh, that's great. From a photo booth at a local amusement park. Thank you very much. Thank you. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.